Would you consider yourself a high level entrepreneur? Now, most likely if you're listening to this, you definitely are. And what I've heard over and over and over again is it's hard to find like-minded people that are like that too. Again, I'm from Maine, so I totally understand how difficult it can be. Thank goodness I have an amazing online community, so I know tons of them. And that is exactly why we are starting this brand new mastermind group with high-level like-minded entrepreneurs, the ones that you know you can go alongside with that will help move you to the next level, let alone with kick butt coaching from me because I like to slap you around both on focus and on strategy. So if you're looking to double or triple this year, which I know most of you are, I want you to go ahead and apply and see if it's a good fit for you. I will totally tell you if it's not and if I wouldn't do it if I were you, uh, but go to eventualmillionaire.com slash apply. We are looking for amazing like-minded entrepreneurs. My previous mastermind members have told me it is life changing. So take the time today, fill out the very quick application and we'll see if it's a fit. Take care. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters. And today on the show, I'm so glad to have my friend Dan Vega. You can check him out at danvegabusiness.com. Also, mostly because he's a serial entrepreneur and has so many businesses, I couldn't list all of them, like a publishing company. He's got Blue Television. He's got Blue University, all sorts of things. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure, Jamie. Thanks for having me. I love serial entrepreneurs, and when I try and look at the bio, I'm like, I'm just going to say serial entrepreneur and mention a whole bunch of things because a whole lifetime yeah. in one little intro is always difficult. So so how did you end up creating these businesses? Um, because normally we'll go out and do one, but you have so many. You didn't create them all at the same time, I'm assuming. You tell me. No, a lot of it was part of the journey of I was. I had a need that I had to figure out and satisfy, and then once I figured it out, I'm like, hey this solution really works for me and then eventually turned into a business. So I didn't set out to start all these things, but through my journey, I put together some components that worked and eventually they became businesses. See, I find that so interesting, especially because you see opportunities and you want to solve problems, right? And everybody yeah. else has this problem too. Uh, so why couldn't you find something like that in the marketplace already? Why did you have to sort of go try and figure it out yourself? Um, there probably was other things in the marketplace. You know, one of my mentors years ago, he told me that one of the big mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they look for opportunities to make money. And sometimes that can actually be a, a, a curse because we get pretty good at identifying, oh man, I could make money there, I could make money there. And after a while, it's easy to get a lot of balls in the air, just enough to distract us from being good at anything. So his advice was look for a problem to solve. And if you can solve it well, chances are a lot of people have that need. So when I would run into an obstacle in my own career, I would just, I didn't really look out what was available or not. I just looked for how to solve it. And if I came up with a really great solution, you know, after a while I found myself giving advice and helping other people solve it. And then I'm saying, I should monetize this and, and create a business after it. And that's, kind of how it happened. Like I already solved the problem. I as well make money from it. So it's not just, yeah, you know, right. just for me. That's yeah. awesome. Well, you have a crazy background though, too, with mathematician and all sorts of stuff. So can you give us a synopsis of sort of your upbringing so we can be up to speed? Sure. You know, so I'm really not that smart of a guy. I think that I honestly believe that luck is a lot of success. I think timing, standing in the right place at the right time. I know a lot of people would say there's no such thing as luck. You make your own luck. But I do believe that I've been fortunate many times of just being at the right place at the right time. I was raised in the Los Angeles area. Um, both of my parents never really had a lot of uh, financial success. And it was a very abusive kind of alcoholic situation. So I have a condition called uh, synesthesia, which is very similar to like a form of autism. And um, because of that, I have a very high inertia towards mathematics. And so when I was very young, the one of the universities in California uh, asked me to kind of live part time on the campus, which was a great exit strategy out of my situation. And because of that one thing, very great people took an interest in me young and wanted to mentor me and kind of I would help vet their business plans or I would help 
um, make sure that their math was congruent in whatever they were trying to do. And by the time I was 18 or 19, you know, they were passing me to all their friends and I, ha I had to hire like, like a, an assistant. And, and basically it was like the running joke of before any of the big companies in Silicon Valley or the big companies in LA have their mastermind groups or vision, you know, things fly down to Covina, California, see this little kid, make sure it's right. So that was how I got my foot in the door, certainly. And because of the education that I learned from many of those people, and because of the strategic alliances I've been able to develop, of course, is the reason for my success. Wow. Uh, how did sure. you leverage those, though, too? Because if you're a young kid and people are coming to you, that's one thing. It's another thing to ask them for advice and leverage that advice or, like you said, strategic partnerships. How did you learn to go ahead and do that? That's a really good question because I was like 17, 18 years old. I looked 15. And so I'm showing up in these big corporations with all these guys in suits sitting around a table and I have like acne. I'm like, hi. It was really weird. And so I, I think in the beginning, one of the keys was just being really vulnerable and being transparent and saying, look, I have this thing. I'll be glad to help in any way I can. I'm young, so I'm anything I can learn from you, that would be amazing. I just kind of took that approach. And I think a lot of people just kind of adopted me, uh, you know, and, and so to speak. And so early on, that was the thing. But what I also learned was these are also business people that don't like you to call in favors or to leverage them. So what I would do is just try to provide value and fulfill what I promised to them. But I wouldn't ever go back to that well. I would just try to maintain friendships and, and provide value. And then as I got a little bit older, I could call this person now and say, hey, I want to sit down with you and talk some business. And it was more of like a equal footing as opposed to the way things started. Well, because that's the thing, being a younger kid, and if somebody even gives you some advice, you'd be like, wait, tell me, wait, tell me more and just keep pulling yeah. on it. But then yeah. you could potentially not burn out relationships, but you know what I mean, take more than you're actually giving back. So that's right. tell me more about how you determine that and then how you determine whether or not it's okay to ask, right? You're like, did I give enough? Because there's always this give and take. And especially in this business and online world, it's like, well, they didn't do anything for me. Why are they, right? There's a, this whole give and take kind of thing. So yeah. what is your, your philosophy on all of that? You know, I think that so many people are, despite what they preach, I think that they're always asking for business. You know, I remember interviewing Brian Tracy several years ago and he, his whole theme was we have to ask, you know, five times as much as anybody else, constantly ask and push the envelope. And if you ask, 500% more, you're going to get 500% more. And I certainly understand the logic in that. But I think today with social media and being having everything so instant, you have to cut through all the noise. And I think that the wrong strategy perhaps is just, you know, asking. I think that for me, I just sit down and I figure out, you know, if I make a new relationship, I'm truly thinking, how can I provide value to this person? And I, I let them in and I let them know what my values are, my personal values are. And one of the rules that we, we talk about and, and one of the rules we practice is having a certain type of an exchange rate. Mm -hmm. So if somebody shows me a lot of value, I try to give abundance exchange, right? And I think after a while, they kind of adopt that philosophy. And so we don't have to worry too much about the nuts and bolts and how we're cutting up something. But I, I don't really go in with, you know, I'm going to cut out 20% of this or that. I, I really go in all in of you have to provide value and get people used to it. And when people kind of get to that place where you're now a trusted resource, then they'll want more and they'll reciprocate and then the monetization will be there. How do you deal with people asking you when you feel like you they haven't given you enough, right? Especially you're a successful business guy. I'm sure you get asked all the time and you don't just randomly give to them also. So what do you do in that situation too? Honestly, for me personally, I have vetters. So I don't make it easily. I'm not super accessible. So when somebody wants to come back to the well and they're like, I have another deal I want to pitch you on. And the first thing we already did, I didn't see a ton of value. I generally am not going to sit back down with them. So I'll have people that, hey, so what exactly do you want to talk about? What exactly are you wanting to present? What are you after? And then I can easily say, not interested. And and so I don't, I don't let them, I don't, the biggest commodity I'm always trying to fight against is how to get more time back. Mm. 
So, and, and the other thing is I'm not trying to find any more opportunities. I'm just trying to focus on scaling and growing what I have and, and, and making a broader impact at this point. So, you know, people that haven't shown me a lot of value in the first time around, even if I have to walk away and take a loss, I'm okay with that, but I'm definitely not going to go back and let them come back to the well. Right. <laughs> Good thing. He's a smart businessman, right? Especially with math yeah. on, on your side. When when you're looking, though, at the discernment, right? So sometimes you meet people. The reason why I'm asking all these questions is strategic partnerships could be amazing for people's businesses. And I know people, clients of mine, that don't even want to ask, that don't even want to approach because the, the scared part is there. That's why I was asking that piece. But then it's yeah. like, I want to ask them, but I'm not sure if they're going to be good or have integrity. I know so many people that have gotten Burned, right? How do you actually pay attention to discernment? Is it gut? Is it math? Like, how do you go after that? Initially, it's gut for sure. I, I've learned over the years to have a good intuition, and I think that's something you can develop. And every time I go against that, I have like red flags going off, and I'm like, but wait. And I try to, you know, go against that with logic. It, it comes back and bites me. So initially, it is definitely a gut thing. But once we start getting into brass tacks and they're saying, here's what I can do and I can bring this to the table, then I'm going to look at it and I'm going to measure it out and I'm going to find what I call the probability rate. So most things are possible. I don't care too much about what's possible. I think most things are possible. However, I look at my probability rate and I actually have a, a calculation of how to find what that is. So if somebody's saying, Dan, I want to go into business with you and here's what I want to do. I have a very fixed metric of probability that I need to pull the trigger and go in. So as long as I think that their integrity is there and they have good values, if that's there, I'll, I'm all in right away. But if it's not, I'm just going to simply pass and say, look, I can't add value. This isn't the right thing. But I want to see, I don't need a perfect scenario where all the stars lined up where there's zero risk. Because that's one thing about some people, small business owners especially, is like they want no risk. And what I've learned is, you know, no risk, no reward, right? I, I'm okay with risk completely as long as it's calculated risk and it's not emotional risk. But I do want a certain probability rate. So I need to know this is a probable outcome. It's not guaranteed, but it's probable. And then I'll, I'll go all in. I think it's awesome that you said that business owners don't really like risk. I agree with you. I know entrepreneurs are like, oh, all the entrepreneurs are super risky. And I've been doing these interviews for a long time, but not any, very many of them are like, let's just throw some money at that. That's a great idea, right? It's calculated. Yeah, yeah. So how do yeah. you actually calculate what risk is worth it for you, especially for somebody that maybe has only gone a little far in as far as riskiness? Because it sounds like you've yeah. got a pretty good risk threshold. You know, first of all, I only invest in things that help facilitate my vision. Right. So if it's I, I've learned a long time ago, I have four or five lanes that are really effective in and that actually facilitate my vision. And when I get out of those lanes, it does not work well for me. Even if I'm able to make money, what I what I notice is my quality of life goes down. You know, so, for instance, a few years ago, some doctors approached me. Hey, we'd love to be a partner with you. We're going to create the most cutting edge wellness center. We're going to create a custom line of nutrition and vitamins and we're going to do and it's gonna be, we're going to have doctors and athlete people and this and that. And I kind of got sold. I'm not a health guy. That's not my thing. But I'm like, that sounds amazing. I went in. I put the money up. We actually made it the number one wellness center in our town. It became really amazing. And we made money. But it was like the one sense of dread that I had with my whole business. It was like that one thing. And what I learned is I'm not in that. I wasn't in the right lane. So even though. Dollars and cents wise, it was a good decision. My quality of life and my joy went down. So I decided to sell it off and, and just get back to what I what I like and what I know. So first of all, I want to be in lanes that that not only I have passion for, but help facilitate my overall vision or else it's a distraction to me, even if the dollars and cents are in my favor. Second of all, I look at, so when I'm looking at a business to invest in, whether it be time or money or both. I need a certain probability rate. And most people think that it has to be like a 90 cent likeliness of, of hitting, right? But in actuality, I need a probability rate of about 12 to 17%. What is and this I know calculation? That sounds, yeah, I, wanna, I would like to know what really that is. Low. Yeah, it sounds yeah. super low. 
So you probably know this from experience, Jamie, is most people that are very proactive and they're studious and they're very assertive and whatever, they can probably become a, somewhat of an expert in most fields in three to six months. Now, you can't be a brain surgeon. You, there's some things you can't do. But if you're looking at saying, I'm going to get into this new field, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm going to go all in. I'm going to go listen to the one percenters that have podcasts and are writing books. I'm going to really immerse myself. Probably in six months, they can be way above the fold, right? And so what I learned is 85% of the world, and I'm not trying to be derogative, but 85% is people that are just kind of like stumbling through life. It's the herd, right? So they are like going to a they're they're going to a place every week. They're doing a bunch of things. They get a thing on Friday. They spend the thing, buy things, go back to the thing. Like there's no rhyme or reason. There's no real passion. It's just kind of a a, a wheel, right? Eighty five percent of the people that run our lives, the services we take on, it's just the people that are going through that the herd. So to get above the herd, there's really no attrition. It's not. It's just being studious and maybe investing in $200 worth of books, maybe listening to some podcasts and a little bit of mentorship. You can get above the herd pretty easy. Now, the top 15% of a field, that's where all the work is, right? So going from the top 15% to the top 10% of the field or the top 10% to the 5% of the field, exponentially more work. So when somebody comes to me and they're, they have this business plan and the pitch is always, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And if we could get 1% of 1%, we're going to make all this money. I'll listen. Okay. But at the end of the day, I'm saying for them to make, for us to make the amount of money they've projected in the time frame that they've said um, in the field that we're, we're discussing getting into, where would that put me in the industry? Like, would that call for me to be in the top 10% of the entire industry, the top 20% of the industry? What Would it allocate me to be in the top 1% of the freaking industry? If it's somewhere in the top, you know, 10% or higher, I I bet on myself, but even with my own money and time, I don't. the probability is greater than 90% that it's going to fail or we're not going to hit our marks. I'm out. But if it's like, Dan, we can make this much money in this time frame, in this industry, and after doing due diligence and research, I'm like, to do that, we'd only have to be in the top 18% of the whole industry. I'm all in. Because I know that just to get above the herd, the 85% is just studiousness and being proactive and doing a little bit of studying with very little investment. And then the top 15% of the field is where all the work is. So as long as I feel like the money they're promising me, the time frame and the industry, all those things don't equate for me to have to be more than the top 10% of the field, um, I'll usually go in with time and money. And there's a real simple, you can do a, a week worth of research to figure that out. So to give you, for instance, I look at this before I get into anything. So if, if, if somebody says, I want to be uh, you know, into you know, beautician, I want to be doing hair. That's great. I always encourage people to follow their passion, but the top 10% of the field of that whole industry only makes high five figures. That's the top 10%. So I would think about that before I even got into the field. Now, 1% is Vidal Sassoon. They're making millions. But if you're in the top 10%, you're only in five figures, man, I'm going to have some pause. However, there are certain industries like the water business or even the soap business. If you could just get into the top 22 to 25 percent of the industry, you're you're in the sevens, right? So you don't even have to fully get over the herd, and you're a millionaire. So I look at the industry and probability rate, and then of course I look at the person and their values. So when I'm when I'm vetting a company, largely what I've learned over the years as an investor the hard way is largely you're investing in the person, not necessarily the plan. So it's largely their value, their values, and then their ability to implement and execute. If they can't execute at the end of the day, it's just vision. So largely, sometimes I'll write a small check where I'm looking at the person and I say, I see flaws in the plan, but she's a diamond in the rough. So I'm going to go ahead and get in now because even if this didn't work, I know exactly where I want to put her. Mm. Um, it's worth the investment for me. 
See, okay, we're going to unpack that a little bit because uh, I think everybody that's listening right now is going, oh, crap, was my business in the 20 percentile or is it in the – how much yeah. work do I have to do? Because it because it's the work of the owner, right? So the great thing about ah. your methodology is that you're investing in someone else, right? Yep. But if they're like, oh, crap, it's me. I have to do all this work myself. Let's see where we're at, right? So, so can you give us – is this a simple enough equation for you to actually tell us how to do it? Or is it one of those things where we have to be like, go back many, many years and hire your 16 year old self in order to get this thing? No, there, there is, it, it takes research. Okay. So it's, it's not anything profound. Anybody can do it. Let me give you a real life scenario. Okay. And then you see if we could, let's just run through this together. Okay. So I, I was talking to these guys in St. Louis, Missouri, and I, I like, fixed variables. Like I, I like fixed things. So they said, Dan, we wanted this. We want like two hours of talking. I still didn't have clarity of what the objective is. So I finally said, look, man, how much money do you guys want to make? Here's the hard variable. Write this down. They said, we want to make a million bucks. And the time frame is 12 months, 1 million in profit, 12 months. I love this because I'm looking at this now like an equation. It's starting to almost be an equation. So there's three fixed variables. One is a million, 12 months. The third question that you have to ask is what industry? They said, well, currently we're in the mortgage business. So those are the first questions I ask of anybody. How much money? They're pitching me on a deal. I turn it back and I say, hold on a second. How much money do you want to make? I identified that's the first question. The second question is what time frame are we going to make it? The third question is what's the industry? Now I have an equation that I could start working. Those are three fixed positions I need right away. So these guys said mortgage industry. So now the way I look at it is like a triangle. We have a million bucks, 12 months, mortgage industry. Question four is, if I made a million dollars in 12 months in that industry, what percentile would that allocate me to have to be in the industry? So based on some simple research on the internet, and then we actually had to attend a mortgage convention in Las Vegas where all the hitters were. By the time we left that convention, we knew very solidly that if they make 250000 in a year, they're in the top 10%. If they make 500000 in the mortgage industry, they're in the top 4 percentile. And to make a million in profit in the mortgage industry, they're not even at 1%. They're well into the 1 percentile. Wow. So the question becomes, is it possible for these guys to make a million in the, in the mortgage industry? Of course it's possible, but the probability rate is less than 1%. It's like 99% chance of failure. So I told them, I said, guys, we have to unfix one of those three positions. So will you take 250000 That's not a variable we want to move. Can we stretch out the timeline from 12 months to 18 months? No. The only other thing is we have to switch fields and get in a field that plays to your strengths that gives us a better probability rate, somewhere around 12 to 18 percent. We wound up switching fields and then they wound up being able to hit their objective. So when somebody tells me, Dan, we're going to make this much money, this time frame, this field, sometimes that equation, it's not equatable. So the way I would look at it is they handed me three threes and they said, Dan, make it 11. No matter how good I am. I can't. I have to move one of those into a five or at least two of them into a four. I have to move those variables, but I can't leave all of them fixed and get because they, it wasn't equatable. So based on some simple research, you can do Google searches saying, if I make this much money, what what kind of percentile am I at? And that'll tell you if you should maybe even proceed in the field or not. That's really interesting, though, that they were willing to switch fields completely because usually yeah. people are stuck on their idea. Idea, right? Like it has to be this idea. They must have been just stu so stuck on the time frame and the money that they were open to the, the different industry. That's really impressive. Well, I think what got them to is I said, guys, even if Warren Buffett came here right now and said, <laughs> look, I want a fourth partner. I want to make you the partner. Before we even get our business license, we, I want to be honest, we have greater than 99% failure rate. It's less than 1% will make it. How much wind would that take out of your sales, right? So that's how I look at things going in is like if it's caught, calling me to be in the top 2% of a whole field, I'm out. Even though I would bet on myself, it's, the probability is just not good enough for me to put time into that or resource. That makes logical sense, which I really appreciate. Then where does gut come in? So if you if you gut check when you meet these people initially, do you gut check at all afterwards too, or is it still is it all logic after that? I think gut is in the beginning when I'm vetting them as a person. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I look at enough nonverbal communication and I look at a certain indicators. And, and of course, we have three types of data, right? So we have historical based data, present based data, and then future based data. Right now, I can't look at future based, but I can look at present based track record and then their track record historically. So I want to know, is this person a winner? Is this, can I bet on the person and what's their integrity like? That's what I have to look at first. Here's the other big, one of the big keys to my success is also struggle. I'm hesitant to do business with people that haven't failed a lot. Okay. Honestly, because if you step up to the plate and hit a home run every time, You'll make some money, but you don't learn much. When you really become a great entrepreneur and longevity, it's when you get knocked in the face and life hits you and you hit the freaking dirt and you don't know what to do. I mean, you're just like, that's when you can grow five or 10 years in six months because you have to acclimate to the situation at hand and survive it. So people that haven't had great failures and overcome them, I'm very leery of because I know that success comes in waves sometimes. You'll have high tides and low tides. And at a, some point in their career, they're going to get a low tide that's going to clean their clock. And I'm okay with that, but I want to know that they know how to survive it and they have the wherewithal. And they also understand causality. They also have to understand cause and effect. The guys that have had it, lost it, had it, lost it, when they get their clock clean, they're like, oh, that sucks. But I know exactly the actions I have to go back and do to recreate this this condition or this reaction. So I just got to go put my head down for another year and I'll have it back. They understand that. Whereas a person that got in from a fad or timing or the right last name or whatever, once they get killed, they have no idea how to go back to that, that condition. So I look for people that have not only skill sets and experience, but wherewithal. And in my opinion, one of the only ways to get that is through our, our great failures. Which makes everybody that's struggling right now feel way better, just so we know. And the funny thing is, is quite a few people that I interviewed just today have had multiple bankruptcies, right? Oh, which, yeah. which, which we're trying to resist or avoid as a business owner. We're like, ah, that's yeah. like the epitome of what failure is. And what you're saying is it's actually a gift. And that's what they were saying, too. And it's way easier for us to... Uh, See it as just, just oh that's cheeky that's sweet that he says that that's great I mean that's great for him but I don't really want to go through that right because it's yeah, yeah. painful so how do you feel like people learn within the struggle like not just the tactical side like I need to do these things better but do you yeah. feel like it um, compresses growth or or you know what I mean you're saying you can sort of take five years and go into six months it, it, evolutionary as a human do you think they grow also. I do. I think that when people survive something like that, I do as a human, I do think that they grow very rapidly. And I think if you look at some of the Titans out there, um, they've become those people be- much because of the challenges they were able to overcome. Mm-hmm. However, I do think that small business owners, many of them never grow. And one reason why they experience failures just like everybody else, but they don't have measurement systems put into place to where they can look at, okay, Here's where I was last year. Here's what this happened. Or I just launched this program. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't. They're just trying stuff and throwing the more stuff against the wall to see what sticks. But they're not measuring. I've had things where my initial gut feeling was that didn't work at all. But then when I went back and looked at the math of it, I'm like, wow, that actually worked much better than I realized. I was just so emotional about it. And I wasn't measuring. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's very important. The other thing that I to think about is the difference between a small business owner and a, and a true entrepreneur. Mm. You mentioned serial entrepreneur. I was asked that recently, and I think there's probably a few answers. But I think the big answer is a small business owner, at the end of the day, they build themselves a job. So even though they're writing their own paycheck at the end of the day, and they technically are their own boss, They're first one in, last one to leave. They pay themselves last, and they've built themselves as a cog in the machine. They have duties that they have to do, and so there's really no exit strategy. I mean, if we're being 100% honest, most small business owners' exit strategy is find some sucker to buy this thing or build as much cash flow as I can because likely when I sell it, 
I, I'm pro they're probably not going to be able to keep up what I did because they're a dynamic person. Yep. So one time out is probably going to go to crap. So build as much reserves as I can. Whereas an entrepreneur going in, they don't mind getting their hands dirty for the first three to six months and being hands on. But from day one, they're thinking, how do I put systems in place? How do I measure? So right within six months, it's automated and I'm not built into the thing. I think it's a completely different mindset, you know? I completely agree. So uh, go, let's dive into that because I work with a lot of clients, business owners, and we look at their org chart and they're wearing many of the hats and they yeah. know systems are important and they know metrics are important. And maybe even they look at one once in a while, right? Or sometimes they have their head in the sand for sure. Um, but when they're, when they're in that space of just trying to make enough, right? There's always like the, let me, I'm just trying to make enough so I can finally feel safe or I can do this or that. It's very um, short sighted. In, in, at least in my yeah. opinion, it's very short focused. How would you tell them to start really opening up and being more okay with some calculated risk to be able to get themselves out of that position? Well, where that problem stems from, and believe me, I've been there, it stems from a lack of trust. Mm. So it's a partially a lack of trust in others. So even though they know systems and they say we have systems, mm -hmm. they're putting it on their shoulders to implement the systems and then go back and make sure the systems are working. So time-wise, it's just like doing them yourself, right? So it's a lack of trust in other of letting go. And sometimes it's also a lack of trust in ourselves when it comes to accepting risk. You know, it's like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to go up to the next threshold on fixed overhead. What if, right? So I, I think that's where a lot of that stems from is trust. Um, the other thing that I think that, and this was a hard lesson for me, um, there's a very successful uh, friend of mine. His name's Mayor Ezra. He's a he's a chic billionaire from Israel, and he's he's a phenomenal guy. I have to get him on your show. And uh, he asked me one time. He says, "What is the founder's role?" And everybody has answers, but what I learned was the founder's role is not to run a successful company at all. The founder's role is to have clarity of vision, and then to think about what types of systems would actually have to be put in place to accomplish the vision. It's not necessarily put those things into place, but it's to think about what types of solutions are necessary to accomplish what I see in my head. And then the, they find a right-hand person, like a vice president or some type of a, you know, org, you know, a, a, a um, operations manager to carry the stick and say, Dan, what do you see in your head? Talk to me. Then they take what's in that person's head and they implement it. But we're not supposed to carry the stick. We're not supposed to actually implement those things. Now, the argument can be made, well, I'm a one-man band. I'm a small business. I don't have a team yet. Totally understand that. But the other job of a founder is to grow the asset. So I always tell small business owners, one of the biggest mistakes small business owners make is they get so busy running a successful company, nobody's actually growing the asset. So there's a lot of companies that their their val their evaluation isn't much more than one year's gross revenue. So most companies will assume, hey, I'm making two million a year, so we're probably a, a six million dollar company. Well, if that two million dollars is only brought in at a forty percent profit margin plus there's debt held on the company, they might only be worth $1.5 even though their company is grossing $2 million. They might be worth less than that. So they're not looking at building it as an asset. The founder is the only person that's actually going to grow an asset. They can't run day-to-days at all. So it's going to take a minimum of at least two people. What I would do as a small business owner, and I do this, when I start a company, I will find a partner that's really good on execution and I will reduce my equity because I'd rather have 60 or 70% of something real than 100% of something that I have to be there every day doing everything and I'm a, I become eventually a prisoner, right? Yes. Okay. So I talk about this, especially with small business owners going from one person and contractors or whatever to really have a right-hand person that you can count on. We call them owner and right. operator. So that way they can finally learn to trust and learn to let go. That takes yeah, yeah. a lot of help. Just that's what we do, right? We, we're like yeah. uh, ripping away the band-aid slowly. 
But for the visionary, the owner, how can they have the clarity of vision, especially if the operator or the, the operations person's like, well, wait, this didn't work. Oh, wait, what about this? How do we hold a clear, clear vision? And how far out? Can you give us some visioning tips to really be solid in what you have? I get asked that question a lot. Um, I find that when people have muddy waters, when they don't have, they're foggy, one of the reasons, one thing that did that is they're too close. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I always tell people is, look, take four or five days off, go empty your cup a little bit, step away and zoom out a little bit, and then you will regain some clarity. The other thing is you have to go to uh, people that are objective. So you might have to go to a friend that has no dog in the hunt and say, dude, here's what's going on. They can see things you can't because we're, we're too in it. But I, I find that I'm very creative and I have the most clarity on my way back from a trip. Like on the plane ride home or in the car ride home, I'm like, oh my gosh, when I get back, I am crystal clear. But by, when I'm getting on the plane to leave, I'm like just trying to get on my flight. So I think if, if we're lacking clarity right now and our people are coming at us saying, you know, this isn't working, this isn't working, we have to step away for a few days, find some objective people. And soundboard a little bit and we'll regain clarity and then get back into it and create some definitive uh, parameters before you get back. So when your people try to push back on you, say it's too late. These are already the parameters. Okay. That's what I want. So how do you actually define the parameters and do you write it up? Like how do you actually um, deliver the vision to your people and inspire them? Perfect. So I do build out the parameters before I get back to my team. But here's another thing to kind of think about and why there's value in someone else, even if it's a mentor, is these people in your company, they get used to hearing you every day, right? It's the same guy saying the same thing. And not that they're not believing in the vision, but it's like, that's just Dan again, right? So I have other friends that are, we, I coach their company, they coach my company, but we don't coach each other's company or our own because we, we know that we won't be objective. And I'll, I'll use that as leverage. So I'll come back into town and say, you know, I was talking to my friend Chase Barfield. And, um, you know, we, we spent the whole week together. And here's what we're doing. I'll almost use it like, it's the, Chase said we have to implement this program. I'll, I'll use somebody else in the implementation. And they'll accept it a little easier than instead of hearing us all the time. You know what I'm saying? Or let's say we're a franchise owner. I'll take a break, and part of my vacation might be to corporate where I have a quick meeting with the president and take him to dinner. Then I come back, hey, I was talking with Mr. Swift, and he thinks it's a good idea we implement this. Even though it was my program, it comes with more weight because they get used to hearing you every day. That's a really interesting distinction, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. because, yeah. Oh, another one of the crazy ideas from the boss again. All right, now we're going to go over here. But I guess yeah. that's sort of the point then, too, because some things fail, right? So we don't totally know what's going to work, especially marketing initiatives or tests or whatever you're doing. So um, how do you get them to be okay with failure also, right? It's one thing for the owner to feel a lot of failure, but if your team starts to feel that, too, it can get a little uh, wishy-washy. So do you have any tips on that? I do. It's one of the biggest things that I live by is you have to constantly separate your vision from your strategy, right? So we could have super clarity of vision, but it's naive to think that the strategy we put together is going to be launched and fully accomplish the vision. It just yes, doesn't work. Thank you. Good. Okay. So it, it, that would be naive. So what I know is after you launch, you don't have all the how yet. And you should, if you're waiting for all the how, then you've waited too late. You, you don't need all the how. When you have clarity and vision, you take the best educated guess and on whatever variables and metrics you do have, you make the best solution possible at this moment and launch because that's how you get the rest of the data, right? So to mitigate that, I tell my team in the beginning, hey, look, here's the objective. Here's the vision. Here's our strategy. And guys, to be honest, this strategy is not going to facilitate this. Okay. So it's the best starting point right now. And it's going to help us get the rest of the data we need to facilitate this. And after about six or seven refinements, then we'll have the solution for this. So as soon as we launch, you're going to see some elements of success, some elements of failure. And then you guys need to get that research back to me as quick as possible so I can recalculate, make a better plan and relaunch. 
And by the sixth or seventh launch, we will completely accomplish the vision. I explain that going in as part of the process. It's even fun. Man, we're getting ready to fail our ass off. This is going to be disastrous. So make sure to give me all the points of how it failed so I can put it back together. <laughs> they love it because now their perception is instead of we work for this company, they were a lot of crap every week and none of it works, mm. is now I work for such a cutting edge company that they rely on me to launch these programs, tell them what works and what doesn't, and then to send that information back upstairs so they can refine it and relaunch. And about the sixth or seventh revision, we have the total solution for our clients. It's just the understanding going in. Well, the expectations are such a big deal. And you saying six or seven iterations is also huge because I see people that are like, ooh, I'm going to try two things or I'm going to try three <laughs> things. And they're like, that's risky. You know, oh, oh yeah. four would be crazy, right? And you're like, this isn't, no, commitment. You have to commit very yeah. far, at least a lot farther than you think. Even for my team, I say timelines and they're like, can we double that? Because your expectations are totally, you know. A little too high, right? Yeah. And and good for, for me as far as stress goes. So I don't have to overwhelm myself trying to get something done in too short of a time period. But when we're looking at, at the way that you set those expectations up, do you actually tell them in advance, like we're going to need six or seven and maybe it'll need to be sooner? Because are you pushing that ball way far down the way so that way they feel okay no matter what? I do. I, I, I have equity in, in maybe about 200 companies. Right wow. now, so That's I've been a, a part of more, and those are the ones that worked, right? So I've been a start of much more than 200 startups. In my opinion, I, I when I hit by five or six revisions, I'm pumped. Okay, it's usually almost every time on the sixth or seventh refinement that thing hits. It just always is in right around that place. If you hit earlier, I think you're lucky, and you had, I mean, things just lined up for you. So going in, I always lay out that expectation. That doesn't mean that we won't be profitable mm. um, until then. You know, I would say usually after the second or third refinement, we should be making, pro we'd be in the black. Great. Or at least every month is being covered, whatever. Um, but we're not going to have a full solution to, the, to, to solve the vision until the sixth or seventh refinement. That's but awesome. I think we should be pros uh, profitable much sooner. Yeah, that's a very key distinction because otherwise it's like keep throwing money. Wait, set he Dan said seven oh, no. times. We need to keep no, throwing. No, no. Yeah. Okay. When do you know when it doesn't work and you have to change the strategy completely? Um, I again I, I look at the I have set parameters of what I want the strategy to accomplish. So I'm gonna launch this strategy and I want that to let's say I'm working on a, a membership type thing, right? I want this strategy to get us at least 25 members in 60 days, and I also wanted to accomplish this and this. If it hits the objectives, those parts work. There's always gonna be some that, that fell short, so then I know I need to think about refining the strategy. But I'm gonna have parameters of what I want to accomplish uh, with the launch, and which ones hit, work, which parts fell short, I need to do some refinements or even look at a totally new strategy. Okay, so, you, so you're very... Um fluid in knowing what's what. So it's not like I have this parameter already. And if this isn't hit, then we're going to throw that strategy out. and We're going to start with something else. Okay. Nope. I know we're speaking in overview terms right now, yeah, but yeah. it's interesting to hear the way that you think, especially with so many different businesses that you've been in, which I really appreciate. Wow. And the time flies like crazy. So I have to start wrapping up, even though we could go down this path for a really long time. We didn't even really get into what your companies are. So before I ask the last question, can you tell us like about the publishing company, about Blue TV, just a little bit more about what the actual companies that you technically run on your own, not own, but you know what I mean? So I own equity in a lot of companies that are managed, but the ones that I'm personally really involved with at this point is my passion is education. So Blue University is a, a university for that teaches entrepreneurship globally. Um, that's really where my heart is. Um, Indigo River Publishing right now is one of the fastest growing publishers out there. I think we have 26 bestsellers. Um, that's been out for a long time. Um, Blue, we have a television network, a film company, and then a coaching business as well. So we provide the education and then we can provide, do their book, film, book, whatever, leverage tools. We can help them gain influence. And if they need more coaching on top of that, we can provide that as well. And how many hours a week are you working typically? 
Me personally, I'm ashamed to tell you, but <laughs> I, I come in at two o'clock, um, Monday through Thursday. I work from two to six. So you're um, ashamed to be ashamed of that. I thought you were going to say you work a bazillion hours. No, you're like, no, oh, I barely work. Everybody awesome. thinks so. Everybody, no, no, no. I, I work 20 to 25 hours. That's about it. Okay. So everyone's like, I want to be him when I grow up. Awesome. So on that note, we're going to wrap up with the final question. So what is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? One action. I, I think the first thing is sometimes when we start a business, we are really passionate and we're really into it or we see a clear line of how to make money. But as we get deeper and deeper and we gain more knowledge and we gain more traction, we get a little more in, we start feeling it's not what we anticipated, right? So I think that one of the fastest roads to success is passion. And I think we have to sometimes go back and say, look, I've been doing this business for four or five, six years, but is it the right fit for me? Uh, for instance, um, uh, if you, I'm sure you watch Shark Tank, but Barbara on Shark Tank, I remember her telling me one time that she was in the flower business for years and years and years, and she was already a very smart, educated woman, very tenacious. And then she woke up one day and says, I'm, I'm doing everything right. I'm just in the wrong field. And then she took – so she had to – that's something that I've reevaluated many times in my life is when I started down this path, I felt a certain way. But as I got a little farther in, maybe it wasn't what I thought. Am I still working in my passion? Because the level of passion that we have is in direct correlation to our physical energy and drive and ability to withstand pain and discomfort. So if, we're, if our passion has gone down to a two, then our actual physical energy is a two, our drive is a two, and our ability to withstand pain and discomfort, our wherewithal is actually a two right now. So it's going to take speed. It's going to take, you know, tenacious. We're going to, to get any of those things and get where we're going, we're going to have to relook at the passion. So that's something I would look at. And, you know, at this point in my career, I'm not trying to make more money or build new alliances. I'm just trying to make more impact. So if anybody wants to reach out and say, look, man, help me get more whatever, um, I'll do it for a charge. I'm just trying to help as many people as I can and have a good life. <laughs> Be prepared. People that listen to the show email a lot, just so you know. So they definitely will. But that concept that you said is amazing. I want everybody and challenge them. If you're driving, do this a little bit later, but really pay attention to what he just said. What level are you at for your passion? Because if you're feeling pain and discomfort and can't even handle that at a low level, maybe it's because the passion isn't there. Like you're saying that that drive is gone. Yeah. I so appreciate you coming on the show today, Dan. Where can we find all about everything that you have? And you said that they can contact you. So where do they contact you? Yeah, so uh, the best place is danvegabusiness.com. Um, I will throw out an email. Uh, I will pick an email. Um, dan at Indigo River Pub, like publishing, dan at indigoriverpub.com. If they want to email, I'll give them some free advice. I'll be certainly glad to help in any way I can. Um, other than that, man, hit me up on social media, and uh, I, I play around hours a day. I don't have a lot to do. I have good systems in place. So if you want to chit chat or talk about your personal thing, I'll be glad to glad to communicate. You're so kind, and I just want to say, anybody who's emailing him for advice has to actually do the advice. You're not allowed to email him unless you are planning on actually taking action from it because you don't want to waste his time. I'll just put that caveat out there so that we know. Most of my listeners are absolutely amazing, and they will. I'm just making sure because, you cool. know, some people get a little overloaded. Thank you so much for coming on the show My today, pleasure, Dan. Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating, a review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank you for being here too. Have an amazing, amazing day.